Thanks to an extensive radar warning network, our continent now would have some advance warning of any enemy attack. But as new methods of delivering nuclear warheads are developed, we can no longer be sure that we will have sufficient warning of a nuclear attack by a hostile nation. And so, in addition to our military readiness, we must also have an enlightened and prepared public. With this in mind, Expedition St. Louis tonight takes you behind the scenes of our military defenses and, more important, into the realm of our civil defense. What would you do if within the next half hour the sirens were to sound signifying an enemy attack on the St. Louis area? What steps have you taken to protect yourself and your family from hot radioactive fallout which could cover much of the nation with a blanket of destruction and death? What would you do if nuclear war made St. Louis a hot city? operations room of the St. Louis City County Civil Defense Control Center. From this self-contained underground shelter, city and county officials could direct rescue and recovery operations independent of outside aid after an enemy attack upon the area. But where do this center and others across the country get the information which would be so vital to the survival of the people? In 1953, because of the vulnerability of the North American continent to attacks from the north, the United States and Canada began building a string of radar stations across the northernmost part of the continent. These silent sentinels of the distant early warning line, or dew line, were constructed in what had formerly been frozen wasteland, many of them on ground which had never before felt the touch of a human foot. In our North American warning system, the first defense perimeter of the Dew Line was later joined by the Mid-Canada Line and the Pine Tree Line. The giant radar antennas are able to detect and track any aircraft approaching from the polar route. To the east and west, our radar eyes look out to sea from land-based installations, offshore towers, picket ships far out at sea, and patrol planes and blimps. This information is vital to our SAGE, or Semi-Automatic Ground Environment Defense System, which would have the responsibility of detecting, tracking, and destroying any enemy aircraft. The brain center of our defense mechanism is the North American Air Defense Command headquarters in Colorado Springs. NORAD directs all military activity in case of attack and passes instructions to civil defense centers across the country and Canada by means of the national warning system which connects over 400 cities in the United States. This is the headquarters of the North American Air Defense Command in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Here, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, NORAD plots the courses of all aircraft coming over or near the North American continent. The ultimate in cooperation between nations is found at NORAD as personnel of the United States Air Force, Army, Navy, and the Royal Canadian Air Force work together to ensure the safety of our continent. Now that we have shown you the backbone of our nation's defense, let's see how this national defense setup would tie in with our local military and civil defense in case of an enemy attack. Let us suppose that an attack should come from three directions, from the east, from the west, and from the north. The radar warning system would pick up the aircraft long before it reached our shores. Constant tracking would be kept up by our patrol planes and by our ships at sea. With all information flowing to NORAD where the entire North American continent can be scanned from one room. All we know is they're not 
not ours. Call you right back. They're coming in low. Altitude yes, 500. considerable numbers. Speed they 500. The aircraft indicates no change. Our heading is at least 25 aircraft. Heading 85 degrees. They Altitude are unknown. 38,000. Speed they are 600. Unknown. Positions at 051015. What's the report? The heading is not 280 degrees. Hotel Alpha 21 reports 40 unknown. From Strategic Air Command Headquarters, deep underground in Omaha, Nebraska, orders would go out, mobilizing SAC squadrons all over the globe. And the Missouri Air National Guard would not be idle either. These pilots are taking a break in the daily routine, a moment of rest, they think. But that familiar buzzer breaks through the quiet base. A scramble has been called to seek out unidentified aircraft. attempt on the area. is surrounded by a ring of four Nike bases bristling with ground-to-air missiles. This one, C Battery, is located at Pacific, Missouri. Each base is closely guarded with security, the watchword. Battery commander, Captain E.W. May, gives briefings from his combination wall mural and battery layout. To protect its citizens from surprise attack, these radar antennas keep watch over the St. Louis area. If the powerful radar beams were to pick up an unidentified aircraft, this is what would happen. The alert is sounded. Each man hurries to his assigned battle station. These vans contain the equipment which control the Nike and direct it to its target. One of these antennas tracks the missile, the other, the target. The information supplied by each is fed into a computer. 
which directs the missile to its target. Mission accomplished, the Nike base continues its ceaseless vigilance. Civil defense centers across the nation receive pertinent information through the national warning system, which can get through to local centers at any time by means of private telephone lines. At the sound of the attack alert, civil defense personnel, both staff members and volunteers, would begin the job specified for them by the St. Louis Plan for Emergency Action. The members of all civil defense agencies are familiar with their course of action, and with little or no direction, they would begin to do their part to assure the survival of the area. Under the plan for emergency action, the chiefs of the various services, government, police, fire, rescue, will staff the St. Louis City County Control Center in Chesterfield, Missouri. From outside, the control center looks rather like something from a science fiction movie. center after a nuclear blast, it would first be necessary to go through the deluge chamber. Street clothes would go over this wall into a bin bounded by 18 inches of concrete to keep any radiation from spreading. Then we would go into the deluge area where radioactive dust could be washed off and drained away. There would be no danger of the control center water supply being contaminated. The center has a well which draws water from 435 feet below the surface. After being decontaminated, we change into clothing which is kept on hand at the center. Now, let's get down to the operations room for our first briefing. for control center personnel are held in this room. Keeping contact with the outside world is of utmost importance. In this radio room, provisions have been made for communications with both city and county fire and police departments. Operating on amateur radio bands, these sets can contact any of the four sectors of the St. Louis Civil Defense Area. This two-way apparatus is direct radio line to state civil defense headquarters in Jefferson City. Telephone and other messages would be received and routed through this message center. Facilities are provided to care for the wants and needs of 150 people for a period of two weeks, with dormitories for men and women. Complete cooking and dining facilities. A first aid room, which is actually a completely equipped hospital. Office space is provided for the mayor of St. Louis, the county supervisor, and their staffs. There are also living quarters for the two government chiefs. If the public utilities are knocked out, the center can continue operating on these two giant power generators, which, with their stores of fuel, can furnish electricity for the building for at least two weeks.
George Washington said, if we would have peace, we must at all times be prepared for war. Prepare is the key word behind civil defense. The job of preparing the public for the worst while praying for the best falls squarely upon the shoulders of our civil defense personnel. Public education is achieved in several ways. One manner is the public meeting at which the operations of civil defense are explained. This is a class in radiological monitoring. This 10-hour course was given recently to brief local fire departments on the problems of radiation and what means of protection are available from the deadly rays. At the completion of the three weeks of classes, the students were turned loose with Geiger counters and other radiation detecting equipment to search for a pocket of radioactive material. Taking part in this particular course were some 80 persons, mostly members of county fire departments and some National Guard representatives. Other training procedures include the schooling of auxiliary police, women's workshops, and rescue training schools. One of the most significant steps in local preparedness was the grant of a radiation detecting kit to each of the high schools in St. Louis City and County. Plans are underway to obtain similar kits for all public institutions. Preparing a lethargic public to work together effectively in time of disaster is the enormous task faced by the Office of Civil Defense. As you have seen, there is a tremendous effort to protect the American people from the horrors of a nuclear attack. But there is still the possibility that the survival of your family will depend on the preparations you yourself have made. In just a moment, Expedition St. Louis will return with information that may someday mean your survival in a hot city. We, of course, don't know if we will ever be subjected to a nuclear attack, but preparation is certainly more sensible than guessing whether or not the attack will come. It is for this reason that the Office of Civil and Defense Mobilization urges every American to learn the five simple steps to safety. First of all, learn the warning signals and what they mean. A steady tone held for five minutes means take action as directed by local authorities. When this signal sounds, tune your radio to a Conelrad frequency and await further instructions. A warbling three-minute tone means attack imminent. Take cover immediately in the best available shelter. Learn your community's plan for emergency action. For information on this subject, contact your local office of civil defense. Learn first aid and home emergency procedures. Know the use of Connell Rad, 640 or 1240 on your AM radio for receiving official instructions. Start now to build a home shelter for protection against radioactive fallout. In a nuclear attack, 90% of the survivors of the original blast would be affected by fallout. Therefore, we must be able to protect ourselves against this silent, almost invisible killer. This is the fallout pattern at one hour after a large assumed attack on military and civilian targets. 24 hours later, the wind patterns could have covered almost the entire nation with dangerous radioactive particles. Fallout protection is needed everywhere. The least expensive and easiest to build shelter is the basement concrete block shelter. For about $250, you can build this shelter into the corner of your basement and have almost absolute protection against fallout. This shelter is in the home of Ted and Sylvia Rimbach in Webster Groves. Their family of six could live here for two weeks should the necessity arise. After the shelter has been constructed, comes the all-important job of stocking it with the items necessary for survival during an emergency. Food for two weeks is naturally a necessity. Choose the food that your family likes best. And don't forget items for infant feeding and special diets. Always keep at least a two-week supply of water on hand. It should be placed in clean containers with tight-fitting lids and stored in a dark, cool place. 
The container should be emptied, rinsed, and refilled every three months to keep the water fresh and palatable. A battery-powered radio is of the utmost importance. This radio, marked with the Conelrad frequencies of 640 and 1240, will be essential for obtaining official information on conditions outside the shelter and the advisability of leaving the shelter. Extra batteries for the radio are a must. Another important item is a flashlight or electric lantern. Again, be sure you have extra batteries. A small stove like this one will provide both cooking facilities and heat for the shelter. Keep a sufficient supply of blankets and clothing on hand to provide the seasonal warmth required by each person. It is very important to have a first aid kit, fully stocked with regular items. Keep adequate amounts of special medicines for the sick and chronically ill in good supply. One person in the family should be trained in first aid and home care of the sick and injured. These courses are available through the local chapter of the Red Cross. Containers with tight-fitting lids should be provided for sanitation purposes. Along with a stock of sanitation supplies, including disinfectants and insecticides. Provide a Bible and or other religious articles, as well as games, books, and toys for children, and books and magazines and other suitable items for adults. Keep tools, a shovel, hammer, hatchet or axe, screwdrivers, pliers, and a fire extinguisher readily available. After the shelter is equipped, it's a good idea to run sheltered drills occasionally, so every member of the family knows what to do in case of alert. This is the family fallout shelter. Now, let's look at a shelter designed for large groups. This type is ideal for office or apartment buildings, factories, and schools. This shelter, built for the employees of the St. Louis Arena, will accommodate 40 persons. the idea of a fallout shelter, we do not mean to imply that without one all is lost. Of course, few areas give as much protection as prepared shelters, but there are some which can help greatly. Even your own home, without a basement, can reduce the amount of radiation to about half of what it is outside, and a basement can cut the amount to about 10%. As you have seen, there are means of protection. But the time for preparation is now. After the alert has been given, it may be too late to find out what you should do. Take time now to learn the five simple steps to safety. Remember, the only way we can survive a nuclear attack and eventually come out victorious is to prepare for the worst and pray it never comes. As we have said, we don't know whether there will be a war. We certainly do not want a war, but we are sure of this. There are forces hostile to us who possess weapons that could destroy us if we were unready. These nuclear weapons also pose the threat of radioactive fallout that could spread death everywhere. This is why we must prepare now. The five steps to safety may never have to be put into practice, but nonetheless, knowing them is necessary insurance against a time when radioactive fallout could make St. Louis a hot city.